Well, back again for the beginning of part two. Um, I'm going to do a bunch of little segments here on various parts of the turntable, uh, updating, refreshing, and making them look uh, new again. Uh, this is purely a cosmetic one that I'm going to do up front. Um, and it's one that I would no not normally do first if I was updating or uh, refreshing a turntable. Uh, in this case, uh, I had a request from my uh, part one video um, to uh, basically a question on how to uh, polish the edge of the uh, of the uh, external platter and uh, so I thought I would just do a small segment on that it shouldn't take very long um, so with uh, with this turntable the thorns actually used an odd kind of metal um, for both the inner and the outer platter um, of course if you have a TD-165 the inner platters uh, these platters here uh, were made out of resin and so it was a much lighter, lightweight, much lighter um, arrangement um, and uh, it, they also chinsed out on the motor where it doesn't have the clutch assembly and uh, some people have actually gone out and bought uh, the heavy metal inner platter and put them on TD-165s so because it doesn't have the cl clutch assembly when you put the massive, the two masses together uh, the turntable shudders and, and shakes when uh, when it starts out. Um, so uh, basically, uh, when you get into the heavyweight configuration like this, um, you need the uh, the clutch assembly to get it a smooth start. I like to give it a little bit of a spin, uh, but of course, when you're touching the platter, uh, you risk oxidizing the outside edge of the platter, which is what I like to shine up and make uh, nice and and uh, shiny. Now there's two schools of thought. Um, some people, some owners, um, resist the idea of shining it up. Um, I must admit I'm sort of leaning towards that because I've got uh, four Thorns turntables right now. And uh, it's, it's a lot of work to polish these things. Uh, but there is a way of uh, preventing the, the polish from going dull. Um, you can uh, polish it up. Um, the problem with this type of metal, it's, uh, it's an aluminum zinc alloy with trace amounts of uh, magnesium and copper. Uh, it's a metal actually, it's called Zamek. You can uh, Google that, go into Wikipedia, and it'll explain how it's made. There's various types depending on the, uh, the quantities of each uh, uh, portion of the, uh, the alloy. Um, but needless to say, it, uh, it oxidizes and corrodes in air uh, quite quickly. So uh, no matter how much you polish this thing, and right now you can see the dull sheen on, on this one because it's been sitting and not been touched for years and years and years. Uh, so it's basically got a nice oxidized uh, finish to it, which is kind of uniform in color. Uh, if you look at it closely, yeah, there is uh, differences. And, you know, it basically depends on oils and whatever, you know, people handling it uh, can cause it to uh, discolor a little bit uh, from grease uh, oils from your hand and whatnot. So um, what I normally do is I use Mother's, uh, Mother's Polish. This is Mother's Mag and Aluminum Polish. Um, and you can buy it at any like, Canadian Tire, uh, any car store or whatever is for uh, polishing up mags and all that stuff. And I just use basically a uh, paper towel. But for this time, I, I have actually got um, I have a nice uh, boat that I like to keep uh, all the uh, metal parts uh, nice and polished and clean. Um, so I brought this home from my boat and it's called Never Dull and it's magic wadding polish and it's apparently it's kind of an, ab an abrasive polish uh, so when you've got a heavy amount of uh, oxidization uh, and you want to get right through that uh, apparently it works quite well. I haven't tried it on one of these yet so this will be my first attempt at doing it. And all it is is a, it's a wadding that you uh, pull out. And this works really good on uh, on my guardrails on the boat, and of course I, we're on the ocean here, so it's a lot of salt water and a lot of oxidization of the metals on the uh, exterior of the boat. So this stuff is really handy for cleaning. So what we'll do is try it. And you can actually see it's. Uh, you know, really good at swiping down the uh, the discolorations along the uh, the edge. 
Now this is not a finishing polish. Um, you can see how it's turning black here because it's picking up the oxidization off the edge of the, uh, the Zamek metal, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And you can actually see it starting to uh, tear down the, uh, the oxidization layer on the edge of the, uh, the platter. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not going to give you the fine mirror-like finish that uh, the mothers will, I don't believe, but uh, I think this will go a long way towards knocking down the, uh, the uh, layers of oxidization to, so I can get the polish working much, uh, much quicker. So this is uh, more of an experiment than an actual. Usually I would just use a lot of elbow grease and just mothers and just keep going until the thing is just mirror shiny. So um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing this for the sake of the camera because I'm going to do some a lot of this off camera because it is a little bit of a labor, laborious task. But uh, needless to say, uh, one way of retaining that uh, finish or the polish on it is once you've polished the, uh, the metal down um, and got it to a nice mirror finish. Uh, a way of keeping it uh, so that the oxygen doesn't get at it and further oxidize it. So if you, do, you don't touch it, and within a year's time it'll be back to the original patina of the, uh, the metal. So, um, so what you can do is uh, uh, use something like uh, car, uh, turtle car wax and you can put it on there and it'll put a nice sort of clear coat layer and doesn't allow the oxygen to attack the metal and keeps it uh, nice and shiny. The only thing you have to watch of course is handling it with your uh, greasy hands on the side so you want to be you know if you if you like to give I like to give my uh, turntable a boost uh, just to take the load off the motor sometimes I'll give it a little start on the when I uh, power it up and uh, if you do that, and if you're doing it from the edge, you could, uh, you know, go through that turtle wax pretty quickly, and then uh, and then open it up to the air to uh, start oxidizing. So, uh, so yeah, so we'll uh, do some of this off, off camera. Uh, you know, I can see that'll take a, take a long time, but uh, what I'll do after that is I will now use a. Uh, used a lot of this wax here. Um, just put the mother's wax on liberally along the edge and then uh, and then basically start using elbow grease. So and you can see how black the, uh, the paper towel gets as you pick up the uh, the oxidization oxidized metal off the outer edge and you can actually start to see it starting to shine up now. Um, so you do this for uh, a half an hour or so and you can get it to a really nice nice uh, reflective polish uh, to do that. So that is how I polish up the edges of the pl my platters and uh, yeah, you can start seeing it but it does take a, work, a lot of work. So I'm going to stop the video now because there's no sense in uh, doing one hour of me polishing or a half an hour of me polishing and we'll show you how it looks when I'm done. Okay, I'm, I'm about 10 minutes into this and you can see how uh, dirty these, uh, these paper towels are getting and I've only put a few kind of uh, layers of, of mothers on and basically I just sit here put it on goop it all the way around the edge polish it until your uh, your paper goes or your uh, paper towel goes completely black and then uh, and take a clean one and then slowly polish it until all the blackness comes off and you can see here how it's starting to come up um, it's just starting to shine and uh, I'm going to take only take it this far because uh, I don't know how long it's going to take to go through this turntable but I'm going to do this at the very end and get it all polished up and that'll be the last thing I'm going to put on just to uh, make sure I'm not knocking this about and moving it around and all that stuff and getting fingerprints and all that stuff on it. So that's why I'm not going to go through the phase of putting the uh, 
uh, the, the turtle wax on the uh, outside edge. But you can see that uh, you know, with a little bit of elbow grease and just with the mothers, I mean, I wouldn't spend any. I did a little bit of a trial on this. It doesn't do any better than the uh, the polish, but I guess it depends on how you know how nicked up and marked up your uh, your outer platter is. Um, yeah, you don't want to be uh, dropping this thing while you're you know it's a heavy platter, so your arms get a little bit tired after a while. So this is something usually what I'll do is in the evening when I'm watching TV, I'll put it down or you know next to me and polish it you know for 10 minutes. My arms will get sore and then. I'll I'm getting old, and uh, and you know pick it up and you know just keep polishing it, and by the time you're done, you'll get like a mirror kind of shine. This is not quite there yet. I mean, there's still a little bit of, uh, you know, you can still see some discoloration, just faint discoloration around, uh, but a little more polishing will take that out, and it'll be just mirror, almost a mirror uh, shine. So. Uh, that's how we want to polish up our platters, if that's your thing. Like I say, there's two schools of thought. Some people um, don't want to go through the headache every six months to do that. Um, and they like the natural sort of dull finish of the other platter, and it's a lot less maintenance to do that. Um, so whatever your um, preference is, um, that's one option. The other option is just leave it as is and just live with it. So um, that's that part, and we'll move on to the next part. Well, I should say that there's there's really no point in uh, buffing up and polishing the inner platter or any of the other uh, parts of the, uh, the platter. The only thing you actually see when you have your uh, platter mat on is just the outside edge. So I would stick to doing that because... Um, you know, I wouldn't even go there for polishing the rest of it. It's why nobody's going to see it. So, um, there you go. Okay, the next part of this segment, we're going to check out a few things here. And we're gonna, going to uh, start working on these uh, springs. It is a sprung turntable and it's a tripod kind of an arrangement uh, with three springs. And so we're going to clean up this one that I pointed out was all rusty and we're going to give a good clean with uh, with all three of these uh, springs. So I'm going to take them off one at a time, reseat them. Um, they do have uh, Loctite or uh, thread lock. Basically you can see the red here which uh, is supposed to prevent them. It looks like they've been broken so it looks like maybe somebody's had tried to adjust them. Or they're just they just aged out and and the uh, thread lock is no longer working. This one I know is is uh, quite easy to move, so they're not. Yeah, that one is too. So I think somebody may have been in there adjusting springs at some point down the road, but that's not a big deal um, because we're going to actually tune it up uh, at the very end as well. So um, the other thing is. Um, Analog Planet, I think, is a uh, website that has a uh, .com, has a uh, really good uh, uh, section on Thorin's turntables and how to tune them up and how to clean them up and get them all working good. So there's all kinds of articles out there on the, on the internet on how to do this. This is my interpretation. It's not the only way. There are many ways to uh, go about it. Uh, one school of thought, too, is the fact that... Uh, and these I see, they are stock. I mean, I, I don't think they were ever taken apart or disassembled, uh, given the state of the uh, the uh, screws and all that kind of stuff that were on it. Um, and it's questionable as to whether these were actually ever tampered with. Um, there are these foam inserts on the, uh, the springs here. Um, most of the tweakers out there uh, tend to remove those and leave them off. Um, I'm going to do likewise because that's what I do to my turntables. Um, the foam on these are pretty well shot anyway. They're just aged out and they're starting to deteriorate. So um, uh, they fit, you know, the school of thought is that they, it doesn't really do much uh, to the springs and to the suspension and to the sound of the turntable. So why have them there? And uh, um, 
you know, I'm old. I don't hear as well as I did when I was um, much younger. So for me, it's not beneficial having those. I will, of course, keep them. So uh, if whoever uh, buys the turntable next uh, wants to have them, they're, uh, they're there. Uh, so the originals are there. I'm just going to remove them and then set them aside and put them in a little baggie of parts that will uh, come with the turntable. Um, so we're going to do this one at a time. I don't want to take them all three and then have this whole suspension mount come off. So what I'm going to do is probably work on this one first. Some of the tools of the trade, um, those are eight millimeter bolts. Um, so I've got a, a, an eight millimeter driver. The only thing is this has no depth to it, but uh, these are almost fully out all the way so I can actually access it with the bolt, bolt driver. If you, if you have to screw them in deeper to get a uh, good suspension, of course an adjustable wrench is always handy. Uh, but in this case I'm just going to take them off. They're just basically one thread uh, down and then uh, and then we'll try it there and then after that we'll have to put the turntable up on some uh, cans and then start uh, balancing it up balancing it from underneath and everything, but that'll be a different segment. Right now, all we're going to do is um, take these apart, clean them up. Um, then we've got a little baggie of talcum powder or baby powder. Um, so what we'll do is I've got a, a, a bowl of just soapy water, uh, just dishwashing detergent. Uh, we'll pop that in. And I've also, that's the reason why I actually had this, uh, not really to clean the, uh, the edge of the platter. I just wanted to try it. Uh, but this never doll, I'm going to use it to clean the springs. Uh, it's going to be very handy for that and to get them down to bare metal. And then, of course, uh, we'll dry them off so they don't rust again. Uh, and then we'll dose them in talcum powder just to uh, uh, keep them dry and prevent, uh, prevent them from rusting up again. So uh, that seems to be the, the protocol according to Analog Planet and a number of uh, tweakers out there. So. I'm going to follow suit and it, it's been working well for me. Um, haven't dabbled with the Q-arm yet. Uh, the other thing I want to do is I've got my multi-tester here. So we're going to do a continuity check. Um, so we've got these old uh, RCAs that I was talking about. We're going to snip those off. There's one that's marked left, marked one that's marked right. And I've got two replacement gold-plated uh, RCA jacks that uh, those are going to replace. So I'll just do it one at a time. Obviously, I don't want to get left and right mixed up because the problem with these uh, uh, cords is there's no markings on it. So uh, other than the, uh, the, R the old RCAs, which marks left and right, um, if you take them both off, you'll soon realize that you don't know which one is left and which one is right other than going to a multi-tester. And, and, uh, but then you have to know the configuration of the arm tube and and it's just easier this way, so we're going to do it that way. Um, so what I want to do is do a continuity test for the uh, the grounding um, ground portions of the uh, of the uh, RCA cables all the way up to the uh, to the head shell mount on the tone arm, and then also the uh, the two right and left channel uh, positive uh, terminals, and just make sure we're getting good continuity for uh, um, for those. I have no reason to believe it's not because it was working when uh, when I brought it home, but you never know, something might have jostled. All of the uh, contacts in, inside this uh, this block here uh, look good. That's where the uh, tone arm wires, lead wires, uh, lead up to or interconnect with the uh, the RCAs. So all of the uh, solder joints look really good. The wires don't look frayed or parted or anything like that. These are really super fine wires. So you want to treat them really carefully because in some cases there are only one or two little wire strands um, going through to, uh, to that uh, uh, block. And uh, it's very easily, you could, you could pull them out and consequently uh, cut out a channel or, or whatever. Okay, so uh, we'll start. Um, I'll just do one spring and then I'll just do them in sequence, but I'll just do one for the camera. I don't, you don't need to sit here and watch uh, me cleaning three sets of springs, but I'll show you how I do one. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this part out. So we're going to unscrew it. You can see the spring untensioning here. 
and it just pops right out. And I'm going to throw everything into my little bath here. And then this thing pops out. And here are those uh, foam inserts. I've got a dental pick here somewhere, hopefully. Uh, what do I do with... I should have one kicking around here somewhere. No, oh, and we don't want to knock over the turntable, of course. That would be a bad thing. Uh, I guess a needle nose plier will have to suffice. Instead of a dental pick, which I can't find right now, so we'll just in there and that's that little foam insert that I was talking about. So there's the spring. You can see maybe how rusty it is. And inside that was this foam. Uh, it was supposed to be some sort of for isolation, but it, most contend that it do, they do nothing. Um, they're kind of old and almost crumbly. That's how uh, old that foam is. So. We're going to throw that into our parts bin and we, we won't reuse it. So another handy thing to have is a nice old toothbrush. I'm sure everybody's got one or two or three or a dozen of those in the, in the house somewhere. And use this pen. We can pop off this rubber cap and then there's a washer that sits on top of it. And then that's just seated inside the top of the ring like that. So we're going to clean all of that and then there's another grommet here that uh, just sits into the bottom of the uh, into the bottom of the uh, turntable uh, uh, suspension uh, base I guess you'd call it. So we're going to clean all of that up and just get rid of all the dust and grime and 40 years. They're not terribly dirty but you know it's always good to just start from a, a baseline. So then we'll set them out here on this paper towel to dry. And this is the, should have almost maybe made that, let's dry this out a bit. And I'm gonna use that, that never dull. You could just as easily use uh, some uh, Mr. Clean, um, but uh, white foam cleaning stuff, super easy for cleaning uh, headphone style or uh, turntable styluses. Let's get this stuff so I get my hands all full of this chemicals that are on this uh, wadding. It's always a good idea to protect your hands from any kind of solvents and chemicals and everything. So, uh, I'm trying to do it right here, although sometimes I, as you can see right there, I sometimes cheat. So, yeah, the rust is coming off really nicely, as I thought. There we go. Getting it nice and cleaned off. And this is really just superficial. How much does it affect the spring to have a little bit of rust on the surface? Probably not much. But I like to have my turntables looking nice inside and out as much as possible. Uh, just because. I'm sure somebody will have some scientific reason for it, but, uh, but a lot of it is just you know, making your stuff look nice, just like people in their automobiles you can get a bit anal. And that would be me about turntables. There we go. Yeah, no more rust. Okay, and then we're gonna clean that off real good and then we'll dry it of course we don't want to have any residual water on it and that's a little bit of dirt and schmeg coming off of it 
A good thing, the, the other reason why you want to not disassemble everything is then you've got another baseline in case you forget how everything goes back together again. That way you've got two more examples of how it should be properly assembled so you don't get any of the grommets on backwards or the washer in the wrong place or, or something like that. There we go. And contrary to a lot of people you'll see on eBay and a lot of other sites online that people sell these springs. I'm one that really doubts you need to replace the springs. The springs don't go that bad over time and you can always stretch them out a little bit. Um, I suppose if you did it too many times it would lose its uh, springiness but uh, quite honestly most people have never touched these things in 40 years and they've been sitting in the same place and haven't really budged much other than uh, doing its suspension work. Um, so you can see all the rust that came off of it there and now it's nice and clean. So now you're uh, you know, just rejuvenating and of course you're going to do another baseline with your uh, suspension once we do the uh, suspension adjustments near the end of assembling the turntable. So there, get that nice and dry. Let it air dry for a bit. And then there's a little trick to these springs which I'll show you. So there is your spindle for the turntable. Uh, let's get this other guy out here. Oops. Knocking over the baseboard. So I gotta run out to uh, the hardware depot and uh, and get a uh, MDF board to replace that baseboard that's gonna go over here because I don't want to put that back on either. And on another video that I show you can actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna salvage this little sticker just for a little bit of authenticity and put it onto the new uh, baseboard. And we do that with a heat gun basically. I've got a video showing how to do that and, uh, and we'll either put a link to that in the uh, comments or I'll uh, do it and, and film it but we'll see. Okay and uh, oh yeah there's this nut here. It's now got to be Part of the assembly and then there should also be a washer and that doesn't matter which way it goes so that was fairly clean to begin with okay so what we're going to do now that the spring is mostly dried out Nicely with the uh, paper towel. And we will plunk that into the talcum powder. Now we'll keep it nice and dry because this uh, talcum powder really absorbs uh, moisture uh, quite well. So we'll leave that dusted up, put it over there, and you could probably do the grommets as well. Although you don't, probably don't want to dry out the, the grommets all that much because then they'll start to crack because it is rubber. And yeah, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go with the spring. That's how I did it on my other turntables. Why change? Why change my methodology? Okay, dry that off. And 
And you can see how the grommet goes back into the, uh, the base of the turntable. So you got the small side here, and that just goes over top the post and just nuzz, nuzz, nuzzles into that post and is held in place that way. Now here's the tricky part. So this uh, washer goes on the top flat part where you can see the line and it's got the same diameter and that will go into the top of the spring. The spring is uh, sort of conical so obviously the fat part goes on the bottom. Now one way the, the school of thought is on most springs you have a weak side and you have a um, strong side and what you want to do is find the weak side so the one that's the springiest and that actually from the post faces the center um, the center uh, bearing well um, and that way all of the springs are going to react the same. If you have them turned away differently, it'll, it might spring and do a little bit of wobbling a little bit more uh, in one direction than the other. So what you want to do, and you can really feel it, you know, you can feel the, that's a stiff side. And then you can feel where it gets really spongy. And it's just an acquired feel. So that's stiff. That's probably your spongy side because you can see that the uh, the wire is doubled up on this side and on this side. So that is where your weak side of the spring is. So we're going to put that into the grommet so that it's facing you could mark it with a little piece of a pen or something like that, or like a Sharpie or whatever. But I just you just have to look at the orientation, pop it in, and don't allow it to spin when you're uh, screwing on. Okay, and then this grommet pops into the top. And I don't want to knock the turntable over, so I'm going to sort of hold it with my stomach. And then uh, put this, not allowing this thing to spin, and get the, the bolt started, or the nut started, like so. So now it's oriented with the soft spongy side towards the middle. And then we're just going to use the 8mm nut driver here. I'm going to hold that so it doesn't spin. And I want to set it to where it was previously, which is one thread in from the top. And that's how all of these have been set here. And then we'll tweak it for bounce later on. And that's about it. And I'm not going to use my Loctite until the very end, until I've got everything set and, it, and it's got the, the proper pistonic bounce. That's when I'm going to put the Loctite back on so that these, these uh, bolts or nuts don't start to migrate around and twist and turn uh, over time or whatever. So there we have it. That's all, uh, that one's all set up. And to expedite this video, I'm not going to go through that two more times to watch because it's essentially the same for that spring assembly and that spring assembly. Once that's all done, uh, we don't adjust that until the very end and we've got the turntable upright and we've got the platters on and we mount it high up where you can actually reach underneath and adjust it with a driver, same nut driver and get it uh, just bouncing perfectly. Okay, so uh, and then I'll come back and then we'll show you how to do the RCA um, continuity checks and then we'll also uh, Snip these off and put new RCAs on. Uh, RCA connectors, not the cable. We're going to keep the cable because the cable is good. Okay, so I, uh, as I was taking this thing apart, um, I pulled the spring apart and I noticed this post here is quite uh, loose. So that's not good. So it was uh, over time, this, uh, this nut here has drifted 
this one, as you can see, I've got it nice and um, solid. Uh, but this one uh, has backed off, and you can actually see that this one, too, is backed off because you can move it side to side. And uh, that's not a good thing. So that's just a, a factor of age and, you know, it's settling and vibrating, and I guess that screw has backed off. So uh, the current school of thought is you want to snug that down. And, of course, this is where this uh, adjustable wrench comes in handy. Um, my little nut driver, of course, won't go across the pin just because it's a shallow 8mm uh, uh, nut driver. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this. And you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to over torque it, but you want to make it snug so it does not, uh, from vibration or whatever, uh, undo. And this actually uh, connects to, there's a couple of flathead screws on the top. Uh, this one uh, and this one. Uh, this spring does not have a, uh, a screw that goes through to the top plate. These two do. Uh, this one is rigid, and this one was floppy. So maybe somebody was in here and messed around with this. Who knows? So anyway, uh, so we've now snugged that up, not over tight, because you don't want to strip the threads or anything. You just want to make sure all your uh, threads on this, uh, on this are nice and clean, because you don't want to cross thread your nut going in there and uh, and of course you want the uh, you want the there's kind of a layer of scum or skin or something on this thing I don't know if it's just breaking down rubber but uh, we are going to clean that off and just light soapy water, uh, mild soapy water. You don't want to use uh, heavy duty chemicals on these things because you don't want the rubber to go uh, dry and cracked on you. So it looks like we've got that scum off of it. Uh, it could be just dust or nicotine in the air, who knows. Uh, you never know what gets inside these machines. You wouldn't believe some of the uh, insides of amplifiers and and cassette decks I've seen. Uh, okay, there we've done. We're complete. Uh, so I've done all three springs and they look nice and clean. They've got, you know, a little bit of talcum powder on them just to keep them uh, uh, dry and prevent them from rusting. I uh, can't help if uh, somebody spills a drink inside or whatever and, you know, causes it to uh, uh, rust out again. But uh, anyway, we've uh, done what we can't, could. So the next thing, the other part of it is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this down just so there's no possibility of me being able to uh, knock this over. And you do not want to damage the uh, the um, um, bearings in the uh, the arm assembly because uh, that would be a bad thing. So uh, we're going to pop this back down, and then let's move on to the. Uh, is there anything else I can cover under here? So that will go back to and, and retune and everything. And now what we're looking for is the continuity of all these wires. Um, nothing more I'm going to cover other than if we have to go and, uh, and do the, uh, the Q, Q lever, which is over on this side. Um, we'll get to that if, uh, if we need to. Um, if not, I, I do have a video on uh, disassembling that and getting it uh, cleaned out and everything. Um, so I could always always link that if, uh, if anybody wants, they can just request that. And I would be able to put that into the comments section of, of this video or one of the other videos once we uh, move along with this whole uh, process. All right, so uh, now we can get rid of the soapy water so we don't want to spill it all over our nice clean table here, clean up any of the remainder of all of this uh, cleaning process. Um, so now the suspension is, you need the weight of the platter on there to make it work properly, but uh, anyway, uh, now what we're going to do is check the continuity of these RCA jacks. So for that you need a multimeter, and usually uh, you can see there's a uh, I guess every multimeter is different, so there's no point in showing you how uh, you set it to the continuity setting. Uh, on this particular one, 
If I touch these leads together, you hear a beeping. That means we've got a continuous circuit. Um, electrons can flow right through. So now what we're going to do is the same idea. We're going to, first of all, tighten these uh, contacts on the uh, multimeter. I'm going to pivot this a little bit my way just so I can see. So inside here is four uh, terminals that made up to uh, the head shell. There's four little uh, posts here that seed into the terminals there. And basically uh, what we're going to do is make sure that the wires are continuous from the uh, bayonet connector here all the way through to the RCAs and that there's no crosstalk between the, uh, the ground and the, uh, the, the positive terminals of the uh, left or right leaves of the RCA jacks. So it doesn't really matter which way you go, positive, negative, or whatever, all you're doing is just checking will electrons flow through it. And uh, so I'm going to pick a lead here, uh, bottom left. And that should equate to one of these. I'm not sure. I don't have the diagram here, so I'm just going to do it by eyeball. So there we go. So that's bottom left is your right channel, right channel positive. And I'm going to touch the ground and touch all the other terminals, and there's no crosstalk. So we know that wire is good from that post all the way to the tip of this RCA jack. Even though this is all oxidized and cruddy, it's still passing a signal. Same with the bottom right. This should equate to the left positive, and it does. So there's no crosstalk to any of the other leads on the RCA. That's good. Then we're gonna go top left, and that should be the ground jacket probably to the right channel, and it is and it's not making contact with the left channel. And incidentally, that's where your grounding uh, for the, uh, the turntable goes through is your right channel ground on the grounding block or the, uh, the connection block between the tone arm leads and the RCAs. Just for knowledge, you don't really need to know that, but that's why there's no uh, grounding wire on these turntables. And then uh, top right should be the left sheath and no crosstalk. So now we know electrically, and I visually inspected that uh, terminal block that's inside, uh, electrically we've got continuity, uh, separate continuity between all the wires and they're in the right, correct place. So that's a good thing. The only other junction now that we need to concern ourselves with is this little bullet piece that goes into the bayonet mount and I'm not I'm going to do this off camera because I don't want to I could pop the needle off I guess I don't want to break it um, anyway um, what we want to do is also do it from these leads all the way through just to make sure that we've got a good connection between this these posts and the receivers in the uh, in the bayonet mount here on the uh, on the uh, arm tube. So uh, we'll do that off camera. Um, I'll just report back whether it's good, just because I gotta you know get in there with these leads here properly and uh, and make sure that uh, our lead wire is going from the cartridge to the uh, the bullet mount, and all of those are you've got a good continuous uh, uh, connection. So a good little trick, and I don't have a, an HP pencil that has a good eraser on it. Um, so you don't want to use a metal, uh, well this does actually, it's just a, no, it's all hard. Um, a new HP pencil with a good eraser, uh, the red eraser, that's a good way of cleaning off the contacts. Uh, if they look a little bit oxidized on these uh, on these posts and uh, a little more difficult getting inside to that part but you could probably use a you know a, a, not a q-tip but a toothpick or whatever and some solvent some deoxid to go in there and just uh, clean out those contacts as well to make sure 
you get a good electrical connection between these posts and the socket inside because that's an often a very common place to cause cutouts on uh, one or one channel or another channel on a turntable. So you want to make sure these are bare metal, there's no oxidation on them. You can see these um, cartridge leads are a bit oxidized. So what I'm going to do is I've got, uh, I don't know if I brought any in, I've got a little baggie of them out in the garage that I'm going to uh, replace these with and then, uh, then I know and then make sure these terminals here are also all cleaned off. Uh, in order to make sure you've got good contact between the head shell and the tone arm assembly. All right, so uh, that's that part. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to, um, and I'll do that as a separate signal. Okay, the battery is telling me to turn it off. Um, we'll do the, uh, the swap of the uh, RCA uh, terminals. And so we'll go with uh, red is right and white or black. Uh, in this case, it's uh, it's got a black line, uh, line around it. See, that's your left channel. And that one is red. You can see the little uh, red mark around the RCA jack. And these are gold plated, so they're not going to oxidize. That's the beauty of the gold plating on these is they will not oxidize in the air unless it's... Uh, you know, you throw it in salt water or something like that. So um, we're going to swap those and there will be a much better connection than these ever were because these these RCA connectors are terrible. Um, so first thing you want to do is pitch those, put those on, keep the lead wire or keep the, the, uh, the RCA cabling and uh, you're going to be good to go for years and years and years to come. Um, yeah, let me get ready for this and then we'll start again. All right, back again. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on my uh, soldering station here. And we'll get this moved over here. It's accessible. Uh, make sure I got no wires being covered up over here. There we go. A little bit of water in my uh, sponge here, just to uh, clean off the soldering iron. That'll soak up in the sponge. And I did get uh, the lead wires for the uh, RCA, or for the uh, head shell, I should say. Um, we're gonna do this in another section. So I'm just gonna put these aside in my parts bin. And we'll talk about that later. And uh, we're going to do all of the head shell uh, cleaning, replacement of the uh, replacement of the uh, head shell leads because these ones look old. They're black and they're starting to oxidize. So that is going to be a problem in the future. Uh, so we're going to get rid of these old head shell leads, clean up all the uh, connector terminus, terminals. Uh, with deoxid, etc. And we are going to uh, show you how to properly mount this, uh, this cartridge because I'm not sure that it is properly mounted. Uh, in fact, I've got this little jig here. Uh, yeah, it's pretty close. It's not that bad. But uh, nevertheless, and I use that as a rough gauge. Um, at the end, I'll probably go to a uh, um, protractor type of uh, setup to uh, show you how to do that. But uh, as it is, it's, uh, it's in pretty good uh, nick there. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't. This is my own. Unfortunately, he did not have a uh, a, uh, a jig for uh, for this turntable. But I do have a 3D one that I designed. It uh, can be. Uh, downloaded on Thingiverse. You just have to uh, uh, type thorns and you'll see some head shells that I've designed and all that sort of stuff that uh, can be, can be uh, downloaded and printed if you've got a 3D printer or a friend with a 3D printer. It's very cheap to uh, find a service also locally to get those printed off. So uh, where are we going next? We are going to go to our head shell or our RCA 
uh, connector replacement. So we're going to start with the, uh, the left channel. So we're going to get a set of snippers and uh, we're going to do the unthinkable. We're going to uh, snip this thing off. If I can only find my side cutters here somewhere. It's also it's also important to keep a clean table. So let's get some of this stuff away. This is the old belt that we will not use again. And side cutters. <sighs> Should have been ready for this. There we go. Okay, so when we cut these, we want to keep as much length of the original RCA jack as possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick the left channel here, which is going to be the black uh, band on the RCA, replacement RCA jack. Uh, so we're going to go with the one that says L. And these, uh, if, these were actually originally, um, if you see the connectors, they were actually originally connected to each other. But the problem with that is not every stereo has a standard distance that these are uh, apart from. So uh, you find that almost every one that you see, they're not still mated together. They've, uh, they've been cut in order to fit them into modern equipment. It's an interesting uh, thing about these uh, old, old, old terminals. Uh, this particular one is a Mark I. Uh, turntable and they were manufactured from about 1972 I believe it was to 1976 according to the Thorin's uh, uh, website or the uh, uh, various uh, database sites that uh, tell you when these models were uh, in production. The 160 series was in production for actually a very long time but the Mark 1 version with the TP16 arm uh, not the Mark 2 uh, TP16 uh, was only made for those uh, those uh, that period of time. Okay, uh, enough tall stories. Let's move on. So we're going to snip this right here, and this is not sacrilege. This is a good thing, I find. Get a set of uh, so the wire inside here. So you've got a shielding around. And then uh, an insulation, so you got a layer of insulation, shielding inside, and then another layer of insulation, and then a very, 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 very thin, almost one or two strand wide thickness uh, wire that goes through the center. And that's what actually transmits the signal from the uh, stylus tip to, the, uh, to your preamplifier. Um, the rest is just shielding. So, um, and it's a very low level uh, signal. So you're talking very, very weak signals. And that's why these things are so susceptible to hum and uh, outside noise sources. So that's why the shielding is so important. So you gotta really do this properly. So what we're gonna do is we're going to, and then when we disassemble this RCA, and there's different types, so they're not all the same. So in this case, you've got a, an outer shell, then you've got some insulation to separate the outer shell from the actual uh, terminal posts that are electrically connecting the wires. So it's not attached electrically to the outside shell, because if you did, you'd touch it and it would start humming. Um, that would be a bad thing. Um, and then inside you have uh, a center terminal where that skinny, skinny little wire is. On this particular one, it's a screwed, a screwed uh, connection in the middle. I don't know if this can, there we go, right at that. That's where the, uh, the signal wire goes in. The grounding shield, actually this gets crimped around the grounding shield. And those electrically have to be spaced apart. They have to be isolated from each other. Otherwise you'll run into problems again. Uh, this particular one uses a screw to uh, screw into that uh, that little thin lead wire. Uh, yeah, we're not going to really use that. They're they're not very effective electrical connections. Uh, just a screw a, a screw uh, connection. 
Uh, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to solder the wire into that uh, little slot there. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, very, 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 very fine work. Um, you just have to not be too shaky and just trust your, uh, your skills, I guess. And I've botched things before, so there we go. So now you can see the... So the shield is actually just a multi bunch of copper wires all stranded together uh, around a center uh, insulator, which you can see there. I don't know if I can get this closer to the camera. So you can see the uh, stranded wire that's all wrapped around and shielding that uh, that lead wire there, or the uh, signal wire that's inside that little yellow insulator. And we're going to have to uh, strip that off a little bit to expose that so we can actually solder that wire into the center connecting piece of the RCA jack there. So that's going to, the shielding will get uh, crimped on there and then the center wire will be uh, soldered into uh, that. I'm, once I've crimped this together I will drop a bit of solder to electrically connect it to the, uh, uh, the grounding post on this uh, RCA uh, jack there. Uh, so before you do all of that you want to make sure that this piece is threaded through the wire because once you solder that on you can't put this over the top and put it back on so you have to make sure that's there and then what I use is um, I'll probably use a little bit of electrical tape because the space of that hole is, is a lar much larger diameter than the uh, than the wire diameter you can see that there's quite a bit of flop or slosh there. So what we'll do is we'll probably find out where that's going to connect up and then we'll put a little bit of electrical tape and then we're going to use some shrink tubing just to make sure it's uh, uh, going to uh, not flop around inside there and actually and you can accidentally pull the, uh, the, uh, the wire out of the, uh, the RCA connector. So it's a little bit of uh, surgery, but uh, it's not that overly uh, complicated, hopefully. So let's just see if we have enough. Yeah, I think we're good. And you also have to make sure none of these little single strands of copper wire uh, come forward and touch that center place where you're going to uh, solder the, the lead wire to or the uh, the signal wire to the center of the uh, uh, of the RCA jack. So we're going to just peel those back and make sure no other wires are exposed because you don't want those two touching the the grounding wire touching the signal wire. Otherwise, you will not get sound out of your turntable, or you'll get humming, nasty humming. Uh, okay, and this is where you can maybe need a, a helping hand here. It's a third hand in order to uh, allow you to uh, properly solder things together. These are very, very handy. So. I'm just going to expose the signal wire here, and we did. Maybe we need a little bit more. There we go. I think we need a little more. There we go. Perfect. So now you can see very tip there 
So that's your signal wire that goes through the center of the, uh, the whole RCA jack all the way back to the terminal block. I can't get it to focus any better than that. There we go. Anyway, I don't know how to focus it better. Maybe if I touch it, there we go. Okay, well anyway, you get the idea. So, um, Clean this up a little bit. A little bit of plastic is hanging over. Okay, and we also need. Hmm. We need to find it here. Finer bit. There we go. It's just a motorized uh, screwdriver, but I'm not going to use the motor right now. So we're going to unscrew that to expose the open hole. going to pop that in, we're going to screw it in loosely, we don't want to screw it so tight that you're going to disc uh, break that wire. There we go. good. Then we're going to crimp this. Oh, we almost forgot. Shrink tube. It's always handy if you're uh, doing electrical projects to have a bunch of shrink tubing around in different diameters and sizes and different colors. So normally we go with uh, black and red. So the, for, we're doing the left channel, which is the black band. So we're going to use the blank, black shrink, shrink tubing on that side. And on the red side, the right side, we're going to use the red shrink tubing just to uh, follow convention basically. So um, what we want to do is find out where this thing is going to meet up. I think I'm going to tin this a little bit. So tinning is merely uh, getting the wires instead of having them all uh, stranded and breaking free. What we can do is put a little bit of soldering solder on it to prevent it from prevent it from uh, stranding. There we go. Sorry if you can't see that but uh, that's the way the angle went. So what we'll do is we'll sort of line this up socket a bit. There we go. Pop that in where it's going to fit. Then we're going to line this up and so get a sharpie here. We're going to mark the cable basically where it's going to go into the right there. 
Oh, my doggy is giving me a, a heartache here. So what we're going to do is put a little bit of tape around there. Ah, scissors, scissors, scissors. There we go. Nice fresh tape so it's not all messed up. Only need a little bit. And what we're going to do is Just to thicken the wire up a little bit. And then, oh, my dog is letting me know that it's time for her to get some attention. So I'll just finish this up real quick. And we're going to put the shrink tubing in over top of it. And then up the, uh, the wire. You can see, so that when we solder this back in, we can pop this in and then shrink tube it on and then it'll fill up the void of that gap on there. Hopefully, that should be, uh, should be good. And I just lost, and then of course, the other part we have to make sure that's in here before we put it is the, uh, the insulator to the outside shell. So that actually has to be fed on the wire as well. Otherwise, you're going to have to disassemble it all once you get it uh, in play. So, there we go. Okay, we're going to have to do a little bit of a pause here because um, Her Majesty here, uh, everybody, I want you to meet Her Majesty. This is Chloe, and she has just decided that she's uh, had enough of me uh, talking to you and not paying attention to her. So we'll uh, finish this off. I'm going to turn off my uh, soldering iron, take her for a good long walk. And then we will uh, come back and pick up where we left off. Mm -hmm. Okay, back again here. And uh, we're a few hours later. It's now evening. And uh, now we're just figuring out the best way to shrink tube and make this fit a little bit better before I start soldering. So, I'm going to just make this one a little bit thicker. Of course, you're not going to really see this much, but there we go. Back off the screw a little bit because I'm going to put another hunk of shrink tubing in here. And I'm going to cut this in half. Hopefully I'll remember. So I've put one thin shrink tubing and then uh, we're going to go with a little thicker one. And uh, put that over top. So we're going to have two layers of thick shrink tubing. Hopefully that'll work. There we go. Make sure there's no extra stuff hanging out.
put some lights on here so I can see better. There we go. Okay. Now we're going to mount this here on my third hand. Okay. Now we're going to try and solder this on. Got it. Just doing a little tug test, and yeah, now that's working. Make sure the uh, it's a little hot, a little warm. And then we're going to crimp this. And we've got to put this insulator here between the uh, outside shell and the inside shell in. And then the shrink tubing. Sorry this is taking so long but if you want it to work properly and be cosmetically good but before I actually uh, heat the shrink tubing in place what I want to do is I need my little razor knife uh, just to get it in place of course I can't find it I got one in the other room
These are very handy. So I think we got too much tape on here. It's too thick to get the uh, shrink tubing over it. So we're going to trim that down a little bit. And this is a cutting mat, so it's good. As long as I don't cut my fingers. There we go. So that's going to go there. But uh, before we do that, we're going to test the uh, continuity, make sure this this link here is good and that we're not uh, uh, cross-connected in any way. So, back to my probes. And we got continuity through the leads here. So now, what we're going to do, I think, I can't remember whether it was bottom right or bottom left for the left bead. Yeah. And the shield is isolated. That's good. So we've got a good connection. So now we're going to use the shrink, just shrink the tubing a bit here. Put the next layer of shrink tubing on. Perfect. And now we're going to screw on our RCA jack. There we have it. That's the black RCA completed. You can see the shrink tubing now mates well with the uh, hole at the back of the RCA. Uh, we have continuity. Um, now we're going to do it to uh, double test again since I've heated it. So back to bottom right to the center lead. And then the top one should be the outer lead, and it's perfect, and there's no cross connect there. So there we have it, a perfectly uh, hooked up RCA uh, new jack to replace these old, uh, you can see how oxidized, how black and gross it is. Um, it, you know, it's 50-50 whether you plug that in and you start getting static and hum and all that kind of stuff just because it's a poor connection. And then you look at that nice shiny gold connector that's not going to oxidize because of the gold. And uh, that will be a good connection. So I'm not going to bother going through the right side. It's exactly the same as the left side. Uh, but that's the principle of how we're going to approach changing the RCA jacks on uh, these old TD-160 turntables. Um, so yeah, that uh, concludes this portion of the um, So this concludes uh, uh, basically the uh, RCA jack installation. Um, this will conclude part two of my video series. Um, we'll press on with part three in, a, in another uh, series of videos um, and then I'll go through what I'll be covering in, uh, in part three at that time. So uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, I tend to uh, monitor my comments on any of the videos I post on YouTube. So if you have any questions or queries or uh, you want to point anything out, please do. 
um, and I try to try to get back to everybody that, uh, that responds. Um, so there, uh, we'll see you in part three.